Hey, so I just wanted to say a couple of things before I got started with the show. The first thing is that there is an extreme heat wave going through the part of Ohio that I live in right now. And typically I record this podcast in a sound-treated room, a soundproof room. But that room doesn't necessarily have the best ventilation or air conditioning. So right now, it is not safe for humans or technology to be in that space. Because of the heat wave, I'm having to record in a different space in my house, and there is an air conditioner sound in the background, and because of that and just the general nature of the non-treated space, I've had to do some technical wizardry and some technical things on the back end. I figured it's better to roll with the punches and use what I have to do what I can rather than wait another two to maybe even three weeks to get this story out to the listeners. So if this episode sounds a little different to you than the other episodes, that is why. I'm not going to get into all the technical things I've done. I won't bore you with that. But if you're like, why doesn't this episode quite sound like the other ones? That is why. Hopefully this heat wave will pass through and um, we can get back to our original audio quality. I'm going to keep tweaking it if I have to do this for another few episodes. We'll see how Mother Nature runs her course. The second thing is that this is part three and the final part of this story, Date Night at Shady's. So if this is the first episode you're listening to, I wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend going back and listening to part one and part two before listening to this episode, or you're going to be very lost and probably very confused. Heat wave be damned. The show must go on. Candace told her parents she was staying with her new friend again. She and Tommy laid on the rug in his shed staring up at the lights dangling from the ceiling. I don't get what you're so hellbent on having them as friends anyway, Tommy said. Candace sat up and replied, It's not just them, I just been trying to fit in somewhere. No one seems to need new friends at our school. Other than Jen, no one's taken the time to... She stopped herself. Except you, she continued. But you're more of a, well, uh, a what? Tommy asked. Candace put her hands on her knees and flattened out her legs on the rug. Are we dating, or is this... Tommy sat up and put his hand on Candace's. We don't have to call this anything, unless you want to. I don't mind, but if, if you mind, I... I uh... Candace smiled. Tommy did, too. Then his smile faded, and he looked down at the floor. I still don't think Jen wants to be your friend, he said. She'll probably just use you to help with her stupid musical, then kick you to the curb. You know that, right? Candace closed her eyes and sighed through her nostrils. She hoped everything they'd been through the past few days hadn't diluted her judgment too much. School's been lonely. Life's been lonely, she said. Thanks for being here, Tommy, but I'm, I'm not going to let your dad or whatever spirit's taking control of this situation get in the way of what I want to do with my life. I'm tired of being the damsel in distress here. Part of me just wants to rip this necklace off and let him show up so we can end this. I'll, I'm... Tommy raised his eyebrows and stared at her. Don't do that, he said. We'll go see Kurt tomorrow, all right? Before we go back to school, we'll try to get Allura to give us some more answers, or maybe, maybe... Tommy was staring at Candace's necklace. Candace cupped it in her hand. She could feel it vibrating softly like an insect trapped in her palm. Do you trust me? Tommy asked. Candace thought for a moment, then nodded. Tommy fetched some rope from a chest in the shed and pulled out a chair from the table. Candace sat, and he bound her wrists behind her to the chair. Then he tied her ankles to the legs of the chair. It's not too tight, is it? He asked. I think we want it to be tight, right? She replied. Yeah, tight's good, but I don't want to cut off circulation or anything. I'm fine. Just make sure you can get the necklace back on when you need to. Tommy double-checked the ropes, then cracked his knuckles. You ready? He asked. Candace nodded slowly with a look of apprehension on her face. Tommy kneeled and said, Hey, you're gonna be fine. If he tries anything, the necklace goes right back on. I won't let him hurt you. I'm more worried about what he might try to do to you, Candace replied. Don't worry about me. Pops don't scare me. This isn't just Pops anymore, though, Tommy. This is the darkness that's taking control. Tommy kissed Candace's forehead and looked into her eyes. 
I ain't going nowhere, he said. Then he slowly lifted the necklace off of her head. Nothing happened. They both braced themselves, waiting for something to take control of her. Then they heard a roar outside the shed. Tommy backed up to one of the front windows of the shed and took a peek over his shoulder. One of the black hot rods sat in the drive. He couldn't see the driver through the solid black windshield, but they were revving the engine over and over. Black smoke billowed out of the exhaust pipes into the evening sky. Tommy looked back at Candace. He jumped, startled at what he saw. Her head was tilted sideways and she was smiling. Her hair fell and touched her knees and her eyes were solid white. She started to laugh. It sounded like Pop's voice, but deeper, with higher and lower voices accompanying it. It was a discorded, evil harmony. Candace's smile was twitching. Tommy walked slowly back to the chair she was tied to. Pops, he whispered. Candace stopped laughing and her expression went serious. Whoever or whatever was inside of her started to speak. Yeah, Tommy. He's in here. What do you mean he's in here? Who the hell are you? Candace's mouth smiled again. I'm him, among other things. <laughs> the muscles in Candace's face were twitching and her solid white eyes were beginning to glow as she looked up at him. You can't stop this, the thing continued. What he said next sounded more like Pops than the thing trying to take him over. The power we felt was so real, Tommy. Me and the guys were done being stuck here. This is our way out. We made a deal with it. We're gonna use her and get the blood. Blood, blood, blood. He kept repeating that word, and with each repetition it got lower and lower in pitch. The thing inside of Candace smiled again. Isn't there another way out of this? Tommy said. Fuck, I don't like Mr. Davis or any of the other assholes in this town that burnt you up. But what does killing them do? That don't make us no better than them. It's not about better, the thing said. It's about balance. Your father looked into the eyes of the Eternal. He and his friends saw the essence. We aren't a new thing, and we always find a way back in, Tommy. Whenever there is imbalance, so shall we be. Who, who are you? Tommy asked. Candace's chest started moving up and down rapidly. She began to open her mouth. At first, it was just a sliver. Then it got wider and wider until her eyes were just glowing slits. The hot rod roared again on the outside of the shed. Tommy stared into Candace's mouth. It looked cosmic and unnatural on the inside, like Pop's cup of coffee at Shady's. There were swirling stars dancing through a vast expanse of space. The lights hanging from the ceiling began to flicker. Tommy continued to stare at the lights in Candace's mouth. Another roar from the car outside broke his trance. The radio on Tommy's table clicked on. He expected the same frequencies he'd heard in Kurt's room, loud, distorted rock and roll music. But what came out was something he couldn't entirely comprehend. It was a fast succession of tones that sounded like fragments of screams. The screams were mixed with deep, echoing sounds. Something emerged from Candace's mouth. It crawled out slowly. One leg at first, then several more followed. It was some kind of spider-esque creature. It had many more legs than a spider should, and the entirety of its back was covered with blinking eyes. What the fuck? Tommy said. More spiders poured from Candace's mouth. Some of the creatures crawled to the floor and were making their way to Tommy. Others jumped from her head and scuttled up the walls. A tsunami of tiny legs and eyes. Tommy knew it was time to get the necklace back on Candace's neck. The thing inside of her was laughing again, and the sound of the roaring car mingled with the splatter of screams coming out of the radio. One of the spiders jumped at his face. He ducked out of the way. The lights overhead were flashing more intensely. Tommy wasn't sure how much of what he was seeing was real. He jumped onto the table and grabbed a wrench that was sitting next to the blaring radio. Green blobs of liquid gushed from the creatures as he smashed them with the wrench.
Candace's possessor watched, then laughed. After he smashed a handful of them, they began to retreat. Tommy heard one of the windows on the side of the shed shatter. He looked and saw Pop's friend, Bones. He had punched through the window with brass knuckles. Two more windows shattered and Tommy saw Pop's other two friends, Wizard and Bones, making their way into the shed. A few of the spiders were dive-bombing Tommy from above. He slapped them as they fell and smashed them with the wrench. Green goo splattered on his face. He looked down at Candace and watched as the thing inside of her broke one of her arms free from the ropes that bound her to the chair. Tommy jumped to the floor, squishing several of the spiders. He ran to her, necklace in hand. Bones dropped to the floor on the inside of the shed and yelled over to him. He already told you. You can't stop this. Tommy threw the wrench at him. Bones caught it and started to walk toward him quickly. Tommy lifted the necklace into the air and began to pull it over Candace's head. The thing that was in her grabbed his hand and stopped him. He could feel spiders crawling up his pants. Bones was getting closer, lifting the wrench into the air and taking aim at Tommy's head. Tommy shoved down harder, but the thing inside of Candace was too strong. He didn't know what else to do, and in a last-ditch effort, he bit Candace's hand. The thing screamed as blood ran down her arm. Tommy pushed the necklace down over her head. She smacked him to the floor and then went limp. The radio was silent. No revving from the hot rod could be heard. Tommy looked up at Candace. She was still limp, breathing heavily. The spiders were gone and all of the windows were intact. He got to his feet and rushed to her. Tommy started to untie the wrist that was still tied to the chair. When she coughed, he finished untying and went to the front of the chair. She coughed a few more times as he gently tapped her cheek. Hey, hey, it's over, it's over, he said. He untied her ankles, picked her up from the chair, and put her on his bed. Then he got some gauze from a first aid kit he kept on one of the bookshelves and started to wrap her hand where he had bit her. What, what happened? Candace asked, coming out of her daze. Shh, hold on, just... Just sit here for a minute, Tommy said as he bandaged her hand. Did he bite me? She asked, astounded. No, I... I bit you, Tommy replied. Candace stared at her bandaged hand. She knew why. Are you okay? She asked. What What did he say? Did you learn anything? Tommy clipped the bandage and said, Nah, nothing we didn't already know. I, I talked to the dark thing, though. The darkness that's trying to bring balance. Sounds like it's pulling the strings completely now. I don't think Pops and his crew are in control anymore. Tommy left out the spiders. Things got pretty crazy. I think that was a bad idea. We need Allura. She knows more about this than me. Tomorrow we'll go to Kurt's and try to figure more of this out. Candace looked as though she could barely keep her eyes open. Tommy made her drink some water and tucked her into the blankets on his bed. He double-checked the lock on the doors. Candace fell asleep. He clicked off the light and laid on the couch. Tommy tried to process everything that had happened. It all felt so real yet so distant and strange. He used to feel sorry for Pops and his gang, but he was beginning to think that they were too far gone. Whatever force they were dealing with had corrupted them. It was obvious that there was no coming back from whatever bargain they'd made with it. Tommy checked on Candace again, and after some time, he drifted off to sleep. The next morning, Tommy bought breakfast for them at his favorite spot. Then they were off to Evergreen Meadows Retirement Community. They were met with the familiar, unsavory smell as they opened the doors. The woman they'd talked to before sat behind the desk watching her small black and white TV. She looked up as they approached. You're here to see Kurt again, huh? She asked. Yeah, Tommy replied. If we could, that'd be... He died, she said, cutting him off. Candace and Tommy looked at each other, shocked. They looked back at her. Died? Candace asked. Yesterday, he was fine. I, I don't get it. The woman behind the desk looked at her, pensively. Unfortunately, she said, sometimes that's just what happens with older folks. When it's their time, it's their time. I'm, I'm sorry. 
Her demeanor was surprisingly thoughtful compared to what they'd experienced the day before. Wait, you're, you're Tommy, right? She asked. Yeah, Tommy replied. He left this for you. We have no idea what it means. It's weird and probably just nonsense, but he wrote it for you. She slid a folded piece of paper across the desk. Candace leaned in as Tommy unfolded it. Candace and Tommy read it together. Tommy, this darkness is beyond ancient. It has manifested itself countless times throughout the ages to balance reality. It won't stop until it gets what it wants. It has chosen Candace as a conduit. It brings itself into this realm through her. The answers you seek are in the book on the 32nd page. Alora. The weirdest part is he signed it as his dead wife, the woman said. Tommy folded the paper back up and tucked it into his jacket. Thanks for this, he said. Tommy and Candace went back to Tommy's shed. He fetched the leather-bound book and then they were off to their school. Jen, her friends, and a few others were on stage practicing when they stepped into the auditorium. Veronica, Jen's friend with the freshly broken nose, saw them approaching down the center aisle and stopped. The others turned to look as well. What the hell are they doing here? She asked. Her annoyed voice echoed around the auditorium. Oh, don't worry about it, Jen said. I invited her to help us with some of the stage stuff. We obviously need all the help we can get. The show's tomorrow, and this is, this is beyond ugly. She motioned toward their pitifully constructed backdrops and props. Why is her boyfriend here? Veronica asked, irritated. Would you shut up? Jen snapped. Then she looked at Candace. Thank you for coming, she said. The girl who used to handle this stuff graduated last year. We did what we could, but maybe you can fluff it up a bit. It doesn't have to be perfect, but anything's better than this, honestly. Could you, like, give this thing a facelift? We need you, Candy. Candace approached the stage. She felt very small. Jen and her friends were staring down at her. She looked up at them and managed a smile, one she hoped looked genuine and didn't show her weariness and anxiety beneath the surface. Jen smiled back with a surprisingly genuine expression. Candace walked up the stairs at the side of the stage. Tommy followed. Jen smirked at him. Then she showed them a small auxiliary room off stage. It was full of paints, props, and building materials. This is what we've got, Jen said. Think you can make any of this work? A day isn't much time, but I think I can pull something together, Candace replied. It won't be my best work, but it'll be... Jen finished her sentiment. Better than our shit show of a stage? Tommy settled into a desk at the back of the room as Jen left to continue rehearsing. Candace began going through the supplies and taking inventory of things she could use to decorate the stage. There's a lot here to work with, but a lot of work to do, she said. Hey, that's great, Tommy said as he laid the brown leather-bound book on the desk. If there's any way I can help with that, though, let me know, Candace said. Tommy looked at the clutter of stage design materials heaped all around them and said, Likewise. He flipped and counted to the 32nd page of the book. Tommy had looked at the book many times in the past. He'd looked for ways to connect with Pops and his friends, but he had no recollection of what was on the page in front of him. There was an illustration of a girl that had a striking resemblance to Candace. She was thin and had dark hair and dark eyes. She was sitting on a tree stump among a patch of trees. Her arms were raised into the air and both of her wrists were slit. Her face was unsettling to Tommy. She almost seemed delighted by what had happened to her. The blood that came from her wrists pooled up on the ground beneath her. The girl's blood made dividing frames like panels in a comic book. In the frame below the girl, there was a black creature. It was humanesque, but had elongated limbs and features. Its hands had many fingers, and it had eyes that looked in all different directions sprinkled across its body. Archaic symbols, which he recognized from the hot rods and the leather jackets of Pops and his friends, were woven around its arms and legs, and up its back and neck. They looked sewn into the creature like thread, embroidered into fabric. The creature's surroundings were a tapestry of symbols sprawled out over a backdrop of caverns and jutting stalactites. The blood trickled down them and the creature seemed to catch it in its mouth. 
Tommy leaned in and saw that the sigil on the back of his and Pop's leather jacket was carved into the creature's back. Three circles containing a flame, leaf, and drop of blood seemed to glisten on the page as he leaned in closer. Tommy stared, examining the subtleties of the illustration. Once again, the images in the book sprang to life. The creature in the bottom panel turned to look at him. It smiled with sharp, angular, jagged teeth that fit together cartoonishly like puzzle pieces. The smile got bigger, and slowly, the thing opened its mouth. Tommy started to hear a deep drone in his head. There was a light inside the creature's mouth that flickered to life. An image appeared. It stuttered and looked damaged and worn, as if it were emanating from an old projector. He saw the back of a woman's head. She had long, dark hair. The woman turned, and Tommy was surprised to see that it was Candace. The frame of the projection panned back, and Tommy saw himself sitting in front of her. They were at Shady's Diner, sitting across from each other. The drone in Tommy's head got more intense. Candace and Tommy's hands were on the table. Fingers laced through one another's. Soft pinks and blues reflected off of her face. She smiled and tightened her grip on Tommy's hand. He smiled back with twisted teeth that mirrored those of the creature, jagged and malformed. The sight of his disturbing smile made him shudder. Candace gasped and tried to pull her hands away, but Tommy wouldn't let her. He pinned one of her arms to the table. Tommy wanted to reach into the book and stop the scene that was unfolding in front of him. He watched himself pick up a knife and run it along Candace's wrist. She screamed and thrashed as the deranged version of Tommy laughed. He grabbed her flailing other wrist and sliced it too. His laughter and her screams got louder. Blood sprayed across their faces. The demented version of Tommy ran a finger along his cheek and sucked the blood off of it with an over-the-top, childlike sense of satisfaction. He yanked Candace up onto the table and cut her throat. Tommy wanted the scene to end. He wanted to slam the book closed, but he couldn't look away. Black goo oozed from the slit in her neck, and her eyes went dark. Like the blood he suckled from his finger, the thing reached out and tasted the black goo from her neck. Another look of deep satisfaction spread across his face as Candace collapsed on the table. Then the thing smiled and looked at Tommy. Like the creature in the cave, he opened his mouth to reveal another scene. Tommy couldn't look away from the sadistic fractal of visions. Vibrant, psychedelic colors shot from the thing's mouth. They created a collage of globular, screaming forms. Glowing pinks, greens, blues, and other colors coalesced together and made a blanket of anguished souls. They were writhing and bubbling a grotesque amalgamation of faces and body parts that were dripping and twisting into one another. Tommy's urge to look away peaked. The lights in the picture were like tractor beams, though, beckoning him to join the horde of misshapen lost souls. He could feel their energy. It was sharp, electric, and painful. He felt a strange grief knowing that his father and his friends were lost to that entity. Their souls had become tainted by the darkness that was taking shape in front of him. He felt responsible for making sure that he and Candace weren't taken by it as well. The swarm of souls began to take on the shape of a face. Giant green eyes and rows of pink, sharp, glowing teeth materialized in front of him. The thing spoke in his head. Yes, Tommy, your father had no idea what the fuck he was meddling with. He and his friends wanted power, but at what cost? They're trapped now. Mine. Tommy knew that the thing was messing with his mind. It was trying to sway his thoughts and confuse him. Get the fuck out of my head, he shouted. The thing's laughter bounced around in his mind like bullets ricocheting down a steel hallway. You're just as lost as he was, Tommy. 
And now, you've got your little girlfriend involved in all of this. The thing's gaze felt like a dagger plunging into Tommy's brain. He could feel it trying to wiggle its tendrils into him. It was trying to take control. It continued to speak. I take souls that become lost. They get trapped. And I give them options. You want your father to be free, right? You don't want him to be unable to pass to the beyond forever, do you? Perhaps I'll make a bargain with you. The weight needs corrected. The scales need to be balanced. Kill Jen and her friends out on the stage. And all of this ends. Your daddy and his friends get their souls back and your little girlfriend gets to be free. All of this ends if we get our blood, Tommy. No one will fucking know. Just cut their throats and leave. If you don't, I'll take you and who knows what might happen then. Who knows the things you might do, the people you might kill. The thing flashed the agonizing vision of Tommy cutting Candace's throat in front of him again. Tommy shuddered. You won't take me, Tommy said. You can't, or you would have done it already. The entity shot a bolt of pain into Tommy, and he screamed. Candace noticed and looked over at him. She could see his eyes locked on the book. He looked hypnotized, and she knew he needed help. I'll take whatever the fuck I want, the thing screamed, again shooting a bolt of pain into Tommy. Candace jumped to her feet and ran to the table. She tried to push the book closed, but it wouldn't budge. They die, or you, Candace, and whoever else I fucking want dies, Tommy. Make the choice. The agonized tapestry of souls that made up the creature moaned. Things got much darker behind it, and its bright neon lights intensified, almost blinding Tommy. Candace pushed harder on the book. The creature started to laugh again as Tommy sat limp in the chair. The book began to shake. Candace knew better than to look at its pages. She, too, could hear the thing's laughter jumping from the book. Her necklace was being sucked toward it. With one final push, she mustered enough strength to close the book. Tommy snapped out of his hypnosis and took a massive inward breath. Candace caught him before he fell to the floor. What did you see? She asked. Tommy was breathing heavily, collecting himself. It, we, we're, we're not making bargains with it, he said. They both looked at the book. It was quivering on the table. Candace could tell that Tommy was shaken by what he'd seen. Hey, she said. If you need to go, we can go. None of the stuff is that important. She put her arms out and motioned to the props and materials in the room. I mean, yeah, I want to help, but this? She pointed to the book and held up the necklace. This is heavy, Tommy, and I get it if we need to go. Tommy thought for a moment, then said, I'm done letting this thing take control. He slammed his fist onto the table and shouted into the room, We ain't playing anymore. If you want to fight, I'm right here. Candace stared at him. She could tell he was at his breaking point. Let's go, she said. Nah, Tommy replied. I'm done. We're gonna do what we do. And if this thing thinks it can scare us, it better think again. We're in control. He took Candace's hand and looked into her eyes. I'm gonna help you with this. And if this thing wants to show up, let it. I'm done. Eventually, Tommy calmed down. They spent the next few hours taking several trips out of that room back to the stage to decorate with the things they'd put together. Jen and her friends continued to practice. Tommy and Candace talked about their summer plans, a brief respite from the chaos that had plagued their lives. The book sat on the table. They both ignored it. Late afternoon came and practice came to an end. Jen popped her head into the room Candace and Tommy were working in. They were stapling fake greenery to a pillar of paper mache bricks. Hey, she said, getting their attention. Seriously, it looks great out there. I don't know what to say. You are literally saving this thing. A bundle of green leaves fell onto Candace's face. 
She brushed it aside and replied, It's really no problem. We've had a blast doing it. It reminds me of my old school, and I'm just happy to help however I can. Well, you've helped a lot, Candy. You and your boyfriend, too. We're going to wrap it up for the day. The show's tomorrow, and we need to be rested up and ready to go. There's my hair and nails and dress and so much other stuff to get ready, too. Anyway, if you need to stay a little later, that's fine. The door should lock behind you when you leave. You'll be here tomorrow, right? Candace hadn't considered actually going to the musical. She looked at Tommy. He closed his eyes and rolled them under his eyelids while letting out a long breath through his nostrils. He opened them, then slowly nodded his head while looking up at the ceiling. We'll come, Candace replied. Tommy and Candace continued their work as Jen and her friends walked down the stairs to the auditorium floor. Veronica leaned in and whispered to Jen, That bitch is gonna get what's coming to her, Jen. I have to look like this for the musical? It isn't even fair. Jen stopped walking and spun around to look at her. Let it go, Jen said. Honestly, you got what was coming to you. You're lucky all she broke was your nose. You were being such an absolute bitch. Jen kept walking. Veronica turned and smiled at her boyfriend. He smiled back. Candace and Tommy eventually called it a day. The stage looked decent considering their lack of time and manpower. The doors of the school latched behind them. They got on Tommy's motorcycle and rode off. Tommy left the book behind. It was dusk. Pink, yellow, and orange streaked across the sky. Candace jumped as Tommy pulled his motorcycle off the road. She didn't need to ask where they were going. Light from the setting sun etched into the dirt path. Beams of light shined through the trees as Tommy's motorcycle kicked up dust. Candace held on tight as the path wound through the woods and as they approached, Shady's. She waited to see the neon lights in the distance, to hear the soft hum of rock and roll outside of the diner, but as they wound around the final bend, she saw the burnt husk of a structure where Shady's once stood. There were no menacing hot rods in the parking lot, no reflective silver panels or pitch-black windows, just a forgotten, overgrown memory. They stopped, and Tommy turned his motorcycle off. They got off and walked up the steps to Shady's. Flashbacks of the fire flooded Candace's mind as they reached the top of the steps. Tommy stepped over the jutting concrete on the ground that was once a wall, and into the remains of Shady's. Candace followed him. She sat next to him on the cracked and charred checkerboard tile. She put her head on his shoulder. The sounds of the forest at dusk swirled around them. Thanks for not letting me be alone, Tommy said. They held each other and watched as stars appeared in the night sky. The school was bustling the next evening as people started to arrive for the musical. Tommy and Candace sat backstage and peeked through the curtains as the rows in the auditorium started to fill up. A small combo of musicians sat in front of the stage in all-black attire. Mr. Davis was in the front row, wearing a fake smile and too much cologne. Jen and the others were also behind the curtain on the other side of the stage, quietly practicing the first number of the show. The lights went dim, and the chatter stopped. Tommy and Candace found a spot out of sight backstage that still allowed them to see the show. Jen ran across the stage to them, in heels. This looks so good, she said. Seriously, like, wow. Candace blushed, and Jen ran back to her group of friends. We did good, Tommy said as he gripped her hand. Veronica made her way to the center of the stage. She introduced the show with a nasally rasp. There was an applause, and the curtains were pulled open. She ran back to the group to start the first musical number. The piano, trumpet, drums, and other instruments accompanied them as the show began. The stage lights flickered different colors, and the audience watched in awe as Jen and her friends executed a perfectly practiced synchronized song and dance. The first act ended, and after a roaring applause, the curtain was pulled closed. Tommy leaned in and whispered to Candace, I'll be right back. Nature calls. Candace nodded, and Tommy slipped out through a backstage door. The second number was about to start. Veronica and her boyfriend came across the stage to stand by Candace. Veronica approached her and spoke softly. I know this is, like, awkward, and we got off on the wrong foot, but 
You did a really good job on this stage design stuff. Candace smiled. Thanks, she said in a hushed tone. The show was starting again. Veronica and her boyfriend ducked to the side of the stage next to Candace. The second song was Jen's solo. It was a song Candace remembered hearing her rehearse the day before while she and Tommy were working. Tommy was relieved to be away from the musical for a moment. The silence of the freshly mopped and waxed hall was refreshing. His shoes squeaked every few steps as he walked further away from the auditorium to the front doors of the school. He was out of his element and wanted some fresh air. Sprinkles hit the door's glass panes as he looked out into the parking lot. He saw something through the water droplets running down the glass. He pushed the doors open, hoping his eyes were deceiving him, but they weren't. Three hot rods as dark as night sat in the lot. Rain began to roll down their pitch-black windows and the symbols lining their edges started to glow. Tommy turned and ran back through the doors. Back at the stage, Jen was halfway through her solo. Candace, although happy that Veronica had extended an olive branch, felt awkward standing next to her and her boyfriend and hoped that Tommy would return soon. She watched from a slit in the curtain as Jen poured her heart out to the crowd. Her singing voice was surprisingly different from her speaking voice. It held a beauty that seemed to come from outside of her. The piano crescendoed along with cymbals being hit with mallets. Mr. Davis leaned in, eyes wide, watching his daughter awe the crowd. Tommy ran down the hallway, squeaking as he slid back to the door at the side of the stage. Candace felt a firm, strong hand cover her mouth and an arm wrap around her body from behind. No one could hear her muffled scream over the performance. Veronica took a rope and ran it through the belt loops on Candace's jeans several times. The music crescendoed again, and Jen hit her final note. The audience clapped and cheered. Several of them, including Mr. Davis, got to their feet and whistled or shouted praise. Candace screamed again as Veronica's boyfriend hoisted her into the air with the rope using a pulley overhead. Veronica used another rope attached to another pulley to pull her out and onto the stage above Jen. The screams and applause slowed. Jen looked around, confused. She looked up to see Candace flailing above her. Veronica began pulling the rope back and forth, causing Candace to fly left and right wildly above the stage. Her head and limbs were thrown about like a rag doll's. The crowd went from silence to a mixture of gasps and laughter. Jen was frozen. She didn't know what to do. Mr. Davis looked to the edge of the stage and saw Veronica's boyfriend holding the rope. He leapt up and started to run to the stairs on the side of the stage. Tommy yanked open the door. He was perplexed at the scene unfolding in front of him. Veronica and her boyfriend were laughing, pulling the ropes back and forth maniacally. He rushed to look beyond the curtain and saw Candace squirming in the air above Jen. She was screaming and thrashing trying to keep herself from spinning completely upside down. Tommy looked at Veronica's boyfriend and realized that he was the one pulling her weight. Without hesitation, he reared back and punched him as hard as he could in the face. He fell, dropping the rope. Candace started to fall, but right before she slammed into the stage, Tommy caught the rope and stopped the impact. She lurched downward and her entire body flipped upside down. The crowd erupted with laughter. The necklace slipped off over her head and dropped to the stage. Just like in the cafeteria, black goo started to spew from her mouth. Tommy lowered the rope gently and Candace fell onto the stage, twitching violently. The crowd's laughter slowed as they realized the severity of the situation. Mr. Davis grabbed a microphone from the edge of the stage. Everyone, quiet, quiet, please, he shouted. Veronica walked out from behind the curtain to see what was happening. Jen, shocked and confused, kneeled to try and help Candace, but Candace smacked her, sending her flying across the stage. Mr. Davis ran to his daughter's aid, and Tommy ran to Candace. She sat up and looked out at the crowd. The front of her was covered in black fluid she'd puked up. Tommy saw her white, glowing eyes and stopped. He knew that the thing inside of her was in control. She looked at him and smiled. 
It was the same crooked, jagged smile the creature in the book had given him. The thing inside of her grabbed the rope that was looped through her belt loops and pulled on it with inhuman strength. Pulleys snapped, and metal hooks and bolts fell to the stage. Her smile got bigger as she looked up at the buckling stage light fixtures above the stage. One of them fell onto the stage, sparking and zapping, right next to Jen. Mr. Davis scrambled to pick her up and move her away from it. Sparks hit the curtains on the stage and orange and red flames quickly crawled up them. Shrieks leapt from the audience. Two panicked funnel crowds were forming on the left and right of the auditorium. A stampede of parents, teachers, and students were running for the exits. Among the ocean of empty seats, Tommy noticed three people who weren't making their way to the exits. Pops, friends, Bones, Wizard, and Brains were sitting in the crowd, scowling at the stage. Jen's friends and the other students that were in the musical jumped from the stage and ran toward the panicked audience. Veronica and her boyfriend stood frozen, watching the scene unfold. Tommy grabbed a fire extinguisher hanging on the wall not far from him. He took aim at the flames. The thing inside Candace looked at him and screamed. It was a multi-toned, unearthly screech. Everyone on the stage covered their ears. Tommy dropped the extinguisher. A dripping tentacle, pulsing with blue and pink neon lights, shot from Candace's mouth and wrapped around the fire extinguisher. Candace got to her feet and grabbed Mr. Davis by the throat. Tommy ran to them, not knowing what to do. The flames had spread to the walls of the auditorium as the audience continued to rush out the doors to safety. Bones, Brains, and Wizard had snatched two of the teachers and one of the parents from the fleeing crowd. They had bound them with otherworldly, ghost-like tethers and were dragging them toward the stage. Tommy looked up at Mr. Davis. He was gasping for air. This is all your fault, Mr. D, Tommy shouted. None of this would have happened if you hadn't killed Pops. Half the people in this town were afraid of what might happen if we didn't stop them from fucking with whatever they were fucking with. Mr. Davis replied as the thing tightened its grip on his throat. You didn't know what he was doing, Tommy shouted. It was a goddamn witch hunt. Now, this is what's come of it. You did this. The tentacle brought the fire extinguisher up to Mr. Davis's face. Tendrils shot out of it and placed the nozzle into his mouth. The thing inside Candace pulled the trigger and a white chemical extinguishing agent shot from the hose filling and overflowing Mr. Davis's mouth. The tendrils jammed the hose deeper into his mouth. Mr. Davis was choking and screaming. Tommy ran at Candace and slammed his body into hers at full speed. Mr. Davis and the extinguisher fell to the stage. Tommy tried to pin Candace, but the thing inside of her was too strong. The tentacle coming out of her mouth had retracted, but her limbs were elongating and wrapping around Tommy like a boa constrictor. Another lighting fixture, along with part of the ceiling above the stage, fell. Pop's friends had pulled their captors to the front of the stage and pushed them to their knees. Other than the captured teachers and parent, the entire audience had fled. Veronica and her boyfriend were trying to escape out of the side stage door, but it was jammed. Mr. Davis was on the ground, coughing up the chemicals that had been shot down his throat. Bones reached out into the air and Tommy watched as the crash symbol from the drum set in front of the stage floated to his hand. He lifted it into the air and brought it down on the neck of the teacher kneeling in front of him. Her head fell to the ground and blood sprayed from her neck stump. The other two teachers screamed and squirmed against their ghostly tethers. What the fuck are you doing? Tommy shouted as Candace's arms tightened their grip around him. The thing inside of her spoke with the same voice he'd heard in the book. She was there that night, Tommy. Her flame is just as guilty as Mr. Davis's. The other two were there as well. Blood is on their hands. Wizard lifted his hands into the air and began to swirl them around in strange patterns. The piano in front of the stage began to shake. Then it lifted off the ground. He pulled it toward the teacher, who was kneeling in front of him. Flames danced all around the walls as it crashed into the teacher over and over. With each crash, a cacophony of detuned piano screams and cracking bones rang out. The body under the piano was reduced 
to a bloody pulp, littered with splintered wood. Veronica and her boyfriend made a break for the stairs on the side of the stage. Brains put a hand out and held them in place with some unseen psychic force. The flames on the wall began to tickle Veronica's skin. Veronica's screams echoed throughout the auditorium as Brains hoisted her and her boyfriend to the ceiling and roasted them in the flames. Their skin bubbled and melted. Eventually, their screams stopped, and Brains let their lifeless corpses drop to the floor. They were both charred like overdone marshmallows. Jen stirred and saw Mr. Davis coughing up the white foam not far from her. She rushed to him and started patting his back in an effort to help him cough up the chemicals. Suddenly, trumpet blasts rang out accompanied by a series of gut-wrenching screams. Tommy and Jen looked to the front of the stage and saw Brains waving his hands back and forth in the air like an orchestra conductor. With each pass of his hands, the trumpet that had been abandoned by its player went through the man who was kneeling on the floor in front of him. Brains was smiling and nodding his head with each discorded blast the trumpet made. Tommy looked back at Candace. The thing inside of her was looking up at him, smiling again with its twisted, jagged teeth. Come down here and give your best gal a smooch, it yelled as the white in its eyes intensified. Candace's lips began to grow rapidly. Within seconds, they were bigger than her entire head. They were wet and cracked dripping with black mucus. The thing was slapping them together in a kissing motion, pulling Tommy toward her with its elongated limbs. Then it opened its mouth, inhumanly wide. Its limbs tightened their grip around Tommy again, and he let out another scream. Mr. Davis was still coughing and gasping for air. The fire extinguisher lay beside him. Jen picked it up and ran to Tommy. She jammed the hose into the creature's open mouth and pulled the handle, engaging the extinguisher. The thing screamed and flailed as white, noxious foam started to fill its mouth. Tommy fell to the stage, desperately pulling air into his lungs. Jen stopped firing the chemicals and bashed the extinguisher into the creature's head. More pieces of the auditorium were falling all around them. If they didn't escape soon, they'd be lost to the flames themselves. The limbs of the creature recoiled, and it jumped away from Jen. Again, it shrieked with an ear-piercing intensity. The thing's eyes changed from white to pink, with glowing blue pupils. Blue spiraling horns tore from its head, and a hole ripped open in the center of its forehead, exposing pulsing fractals of brain matter. Its smile ran up the sides of its elongated face. It had row after row of sharp, wiggling, pink teeth. The arms of the thing turned red and skeletal. Veins protruded from its almost invisible skin. A world of shifting organs, veins, and fluids could be seen beneath the translucent veil. A terrible and beautiful vortex of glowing neon lights emanated from within it. The creature had become massive and towered over the stage. Jen dropped the extinguisher and stared at the creature in awe. A bubbling yellow tongue fell from its mouth and coiled around her. Its eyes were swirling, hypnotizing her. It wanted more souls and more blood to balance the scales that had been unbalanced all those years ago. Mr. Davis had gathered himself enough to realize what was going on. The creature had his daughter. It was pulling her closer, widening its mouth like it had before with Tommy, only she was mesmerized by its gaze. Mr. Davis pulled a flaming board from the side of the stage and ran to them. The creature stopped pulling Jen toward it and pulled its tongue back into its mouth. Jen stood, still dazed. The creature started to laugh. Oh, oh, the irony, it hissed at Mr. Davis. Bringing fire to stop this. To save your daughter. When fire is what started this in the first place. How fucking stupid are you? The thing's blue horns drooped from its head and then shot at him like octopus tentacles. They smacked the board out of his hand and slithered around his wrists and ankles. The creature lifted Mr. Davis into the air above Jen. 
Then it started to slowly pull the two ends of him apart. He screamed out in pain as the creature's bright pink smile quivered with delight. Hey, Tommy yelled from behind the creature. He ran to its front. If this is what you gotta do to stop this, if you need blood or souls or whatever for all this to end, just just take me, but leave her alone and go back to wherever the hell you came from after you kill me. The creature's smile faded as it considered Tommy's deal. Then, just as it faded, it reappeared. Nope, the creature said, matter-of-factly. I'm gonna go ahead and rip him in half. With one ferociously fast motion, it ripped Mr. Davis's body in half. His spine snapped. Muscles and tendons were torn in half. Blood and guts poured onto the stage and all over the still hypnotized gin below. The creature laughed a deep, sinister laugh and threw the two halves of Mr. Davis over its shoulders like discarded rubbish it wanted to forget. The left half of the auditorium was beginning to collapse. The heat from the fire was almost unbearable. Pulsing blue tentacles wrapped around Tommy. I know you're in there, Candace, he yelled. You gotta fight this. The thing laughed again, then it stopped and frowned. You're so pitiful, Tommy. It was pulling him closer. He knew it was useless to struggle against it. Tommy looked at the thing and asked, calmly, You're all about balance, right? The creature cocked its head sideways. You got what you came for. Each one of you killed someone, and I think you got a few for extra credit. How many bodies is it going to take before things are unbalanced again, before the scales tip back where they ain't supposed to be? The creature sneered. I suppose one more won't tip things too much, it hissed, lifting him higher into the air, right in front of its face. Smoke had filled the majority of the room, and it was becoming hard to breathe. You're still in there, Candace, Tommy shouted. Then he heard her scream from inside the thing. Tommy? Candace could feel the power it had over her, slipping. Fight it, Tommy yelled. He could feel the heat of the flames on the ceiling as the creature lifted him toward them. Inside Candace's mind, things were moving much slower. She was wrestling with it, trying to make sense of what was going on all around her. She had been lost in a labyrinth the creature had set up inside of her, but now that the blood was repaid and its goal was achieved, the walls of that labyrinth had deteriorated. Candace ran across the quaking, cracked ground of her mind. The creature turned to her. She saw it, the way Tommy and those on the outside of her saw it. A morphing, vibrant nightmare. It looked scared. Candace could hear the muffled chaos outside of her mind. It was as if the earmuffs the creature had put on her were loosening. The muzzle that had been put on her had fallen away as well. Get out, she said. The thing hissed at her. It's over, Candace screamed. On the outside, Tommy saw its confidence cracking at the seams. Candace reached through the ripping folds of flesh on the creature's chest and squeezed its heart. Tommy saw it shudder and wince in pain. That's it, he yelled. You got what you came for, now get out, Candace said as she tightened her grip on the creature's heart. It looked like a wounded animal. Its eyes were dimming, and the vibrance of its form was going dull. Tommy saw it changing on the outside. He could see the pain in its eyes. It loosened its grip and dropped him. He wanted to take Jen and run, but not without Candace. Candace continued to squeeze until she felt something pop. The creature writhed in pain and an ear-splintering howl ripped from its mouth, shaking the walls of Candace's mind and the auditorium. She watched as the creature began to fold in upon itself. Its wiggling tendrils retracted, its edges became amorphous, and it began to bubble. The creature started to melt, and she felt the droplets sizzle on the surface of her mind. She could hear distorted rock and roll mixing with screams and howls. For a moment, Pop's face emerged from the melting figure in front of her. Then the faces changed 
to those of the casualties from the auditorium in rapid succession. All of the color faded from the creature, and it splashed to the ground, a sizzling black goo. On the outside of Candace's mind, Tommy watched as the creature screamed and stumbled violently back and forth. He heard a gargling hiss as black goo spewed from the thing's mouth. Its face started to swirl. It became an imploding collage of eyes and teeth. The translucent skin went black, and Tommy heard echoing screams from within the creature. Its arms and legs shrank, and blackness engulfed it entirely as it fell to the stage. Jen's hypnosis broke as she looked away from the collapsed black form. Tommy ran to the darkness and reached into it. He quickly realized that he was sifting through a mound of dense ash. He felt Candace's body and pulled her out of it. She was coughing and breathing heavily. Tommy flung her over his shoulder and looked at Jen. Come on, we gotta go, he shouted. Jen shook her head and collected herself. There was no time to ask questions about what had just happened. She grabbed the fire extinguisher and put out some of the flames that obstructed their path off the stage. The stairs were too consumed by flames, so they jumped down. They ran past the mutilated bodies toward the less damaged exit. Jen was able to fend off enough of the flames with the fire extinguisher for them to pass through. They leapt into the hall just before a massive flaming beam landed on them. Firefighters were rushing in as they made it to the school's exit. One night, later that summer, after the dust of their chaotic situation had faded, Tommy and Candace took another trip out to Shady's. They spread a blanket on the cracked checkerboard floor and looked up at the stars together. The forest chattered around them as a breeze swept through. Tommy pulled Candace in tight, and she took a deep breath. They were both at peace, and neither of them felt alone anymore. I have so many things to say about this story, but I will try to keep this outro brief. First of all, I'm very excited with how it turned out. I took my time with it, and I really tried to write something that I was really excited about, and I hope that you enjoyed listening to it. I've never done a story this involved. This is my first three-parter, and... There were a lot of elements that I was juggling together, a lot of characters, a lot of events going on. And honestly, I really enjoyed having the time and space with doing a three-parter to do to kind of explore this world and these characters and put them into interesting situations. It was really fun to be able to do that. I'm not saying I don't like the the more shorter form stories. I love those too, and I love the pacing of 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 the one shot stories but this three parter felt really good it it allowed me to write down a lot of ideas that i had and it allowed me to pick my favorite ideas and kind of dive into them and see how i could plug them into this plot and how they would kind of like unfold with it i know i say it at the end of all these stories but I really hope you enjoyed listening to this one as much as I enjoyed writing it. Um, thematically and conceptually and just the overall atmosphere and tone of the story, this was one of my favorite stories that I've written on a personal level. So thank you for being here for this experience and being a part of my first big three-parter. On a more personal note, I felt like when I was writing this, there were all of these things that were keeping me from moving forward. Um, like, like there's some kind of cosmic alignment that's been off the past week or, or couple of weeks, and I can't quite explain it, but my creative juices were really flowing at the beginning, and then I kind of like hit a, a standstill or a plateau where things weren't moving as quickly as I would have liked them to have moved. But I just, honestly, I didn't let that I tried not to let that get to me too much and I just sat with it and I I let my brain tell me what these characters needed to go through and what they needed to do and how they needed to grow. And I think that just really listening to the creative intuition and the the creative force that was um, 
speaking to me while I was writing this really helped to make this the story that I wanted to unfold. But it wasn't easy. I had a, it was not easy. Nothing that you're truly proud of usually is easy. Sometimes you get lucky, but on this one, I didn't hit that patch of luck. I struggled with it. And for it's it almost um, makes me like it more. That struggle and the difficulty with this one made me enjoy it more. These characters in the story went through stuff, and I went through stuff putting them through stuff, if that makes sense. I'm really excited for the next story. I already have um, the premise in mind, and I've already started taking notes on on what it's going to be. And I'm really working to have that out to you sooner than later. Once again, thank you for... Um, a lot of you might not ev- have even noticed I'm a very audio-oriented person having a music and audio production background before getting into writing. Uh, but thank you for dealing with me, dealing with this heat wave that's going through. If you are affected by this incredibly intense weather, please stay hydrated, please stay safe, and please um, check on your loved ones while we're going through this phase of the summer season because it is incredibly dangerous. And just be safe. Take precautions. Drink water. If you'd like to support the podcast, there are many ways you can do so. You can leave a rating or review on whatever podcast streaming service you're listening to this on. Telling your friends or family about this show goes a really long way. I also have a Patreon where I share exclusive content and early access to episodes and things like that. You kind of get a deeper glimpse into what makes all of this uh, tick or where my mind's at when I'm writing these stories. The link to that will be in the show notes. And I just want to thank you one more time for um, allowing me to express myself and to explore these stories, these characters, these universes. It brings me great joy and great therapy to be able to give you these stories. Take care of yourselves out there. I'll see you next time. And until then, keep creating. Mm